All right. We've discussed the bias. We started talking about biasing. We've talked about basic amplifier stages, and then we started talking about biasing. Last time, what we talked about mostly was very elementary biasing techniques, essentially using some sort of a, essentially started with a voltage source, and we said that oh, we don't have voltage sources. We try to replace that with some sort of a resistive biasing and a network to create that, and we saw that some of them were more preferred to the other ones. Some of them were, for example, in the case of a bipolar transistor, they were very sensitive to beta when you had self-biasing, and then we introduced the emitter degeneration, for example, to make it less sensitive. And then we saw that if you have actually a resistive divider, we have more control. So the idea was here to make it less dependent on the parameters of a transistor. The kind of biasing we looked at last time was really a discrete kind of design biasing, right? I mean, we had a transistor, we had these resistors, and then we introduced these resistors to make the biasing stable. Then we introduced these bypass caps and coupling caps to, to take that effect away and make sure that we have AC gain and things like that. So that was very classic discrete electronic design. Now, in integrated design, so today we'll spend time um, and talk about how we bias things in, in ICs. And on the surface of it, it may look very, very different. And the reason for it, again, goes back to the economics of ICs and some of the properties of ICs. For example, so what, is, what do we mean by economics? The economics means that transistors are incrementally free. You can use as many transistors as you want. There's no limitation. In the case of a discrete design, actually transistors are the expensive part. Resistors and capacitors are cheaper, right? So you want to minimize the number of transistors that you're using. Here, you don't care. I mean, you, basically, they are cheap because they're very small in general, depending on how you make it. The second part of the thing that goes into this biasing techniques and the basic principle that dictates the way we do things, and we'll see the evolution and progression of some of these designs today, too, is that in principle, if you make two things that are close to each other, in a batch process, which is the way you make ICs, right? You make them in a batch process. You have a wafer. You make millions of, billions of transistors next to each other on the same wafer, right? Now, when you do that, in principle, you can control how close they are to each other better than two off-the-shelf transistors that may have been made at two different times, although they have the same part number at different times or different places, et cetera, et cetera. So two things that are made at the same time within the same batch process, in close proximity to each other, have better matching. They match better. And we rely on that to some extent. Now, of course, there's a limit to this matching. As we discussed briefly you know, a couple of lectures ago, we talked about, for example, how you can make this matching even better. We talked about common centroid, and we're getting around the gradients and all those things. But the basic principle that dictates all of these things is that you can get a reasonably good matching in integrated circuits. So if you start with these two basic principles, then you will see that there's a natural progression that leads to the kind of topologies that we use for biasing. So it's not, they're not just like randomly coming out of the, they're not pulled out of thin air. They're really coming from these considerations. Okay, so what are some of these biasing techniques? Some, some of, how do we do that? So one of the things that, for example, we talked about briefly and we'll explore more today is this concept of current emitter. So what was a current emitter? So you can actually think about a bipolar example, or a MOSFET, or any arbitrary device. And the concept of current mirror was that if you have two transistors, in the case of a bipolar, that share the same VBE, right, they, to the first order, they would have the same current. So if you, for example, if you have a current I, that's called I reference, right, that's going into this thing, of course, this would be replaced. Of course, you need to provide a pathway for this base current, so, and this node should not be floating. So usually, what, this is what you do. You have a diet connection here. And what this does is that it provides a pathway for the base current. So let's call this IB1 and IB2. And, there, and this, is, let's say that this is IREF. And this is, a, we have to also assume that this is attached to a high enough potential, let's say VCC for now, or some voltage, so that this does not enter the saturation. This remains in the forward active region, in the FIR, right? And if that, that's the case, what happens in this block is that you, they are sharing the same VBE. And we know that the, the equation describing, or in the forward active region, 
the collector current is given by IS E to the VBE over VT, this VT being KT over Q, um, times 1 plus VCE over VA, right? So they are sharing the same VBE. So if you actually look at this expression a little bit more carefully, you will see that, for example, let's call this IC1 and let's call this IC2. So we know that IC1 over IC2 is going to be IS of, let's say, this, this, and let's say these two transistors are made the same. So this is, this is where that assumption comes from, that assumption that you can make them match reasonably well. You can make them look the same. So basically, it means the way it's expressed is that it's their ISs, this quote unquote saturation currents, which we know is not really a good terminology because it came from really the saturation of the number of electrons that you had in vacuum tubes, but it was carried over and borrowed. But anyway, so IS, they have the same ISs. So the assumption here is that they, you can make them match. And if you start with that assumption, so the first one would be IS e to the VBE over VT, 1 plus. So here, you, what is the VCE? What is the VCE of this guy? It's VBE on, right? VBE, like it's 0 0.7, 0 0.8. We saw, and why, we saw why it is 0.7 last time. It's an artifact of the typical currents that we are working with and the typical ISs that we are dealing with. It's, there's nothing magical about that number of 0.7 or 0.6. If you're dealing with different kind of transistors, for example, in silicon germanium transistors, it's actually higher for the typical currents because of the way the numbers are. And then the denominator is the same thing. They share the same VBE, but they have a difference. So let's call this V out. Let's call this even V out. Okay. Um, v out over, and this should be VA, sorry. This should be correct that. This is the early voltage. This is the early voltage, not VT. So you can see that if there is matching, so there's an assumption here in this cancellation. It's not just a blind mathematical operation. This assumes matching. Okay, this cancellation. Now this cancellation assumes KVL, which is reasonably good assumption. So what's left is this thing. So you can see that actually the ratio of the two currents are not the same. And this is exactly, such a, and there's another relationship here. And if you really want to get into the details of this thing, which is that IREF provides IC1 plus the two IBs, right? So you can actually write IREF as being IC1 plus IB1 plus IB2. But you can also express these things in terms of the ICs. So you can write this as IC1 times 1 plus uh, 1 over beta, coming from this one, plus IC2 over beta. And if you assume that the early voltage is large enough, then you can see that these two will be similar to each other for typical voltages. So then in that case, so assuming, so now here assuming that VA is much greater than V out and we be on, then you basically can say IC2 is roughly IC1. They become kind of equal, right? You can see it in the limit. If VA goes to infinity, those two terms disappear, so basically the ratio becomes one. Right? But it's, it's an approximation. It's, it depends on the output here. And, but again, in that case, and if you make, take that assumption so you can see I ref, is going to be IC1 times 1 plus 2 over beta, roughly. So you can see that there's a relationship between IC1 and IREF, which you can calculate. I mean, this is not anything magical. It's something to be aware of, that there's this current that needs to be fed, it needs to be provided here. Part of it comes from the IREF. So if you're looking at something that's super precise, then part of this IREF, not all of this IREF is IC. Part of it is providing the IBs, the base currents. Again, something to be aware of. Nothing earth shattering or too fundamental, but something to be aware of. Now, and that's based the basic basics of the current meter. Now, so the idea here is that if you have a good reference, this reference, right? Somehow, let's say we have this magical reference that has good properties. The good thing about this thing is that it says you can replicate, you can make a copy, a copy of that. Right? 
because now I can feed this to whatever I want to bias this path. This is my new current source. Now you may come back and say, well, you used one to make one. So you didn't gain anything, right? Did we gain anything by doing this? Well, yeah, but you used it up and you made one. Why didn't, why didn't you just take this magic current source and put it there anyway to begin with and use that? But why? Yes? You can make mirror more than once. You can copy it, replicate it more than once. So this is the golden, I don't know, the golden egg or the golden goose or whatever. So, so, so here you can make more copies. I can take it here and make another copy of this thing and feed something else. And I can make yet another copy of that. Because they all are sharing the same VBE, right? I can make multiple copies. And not only we can do that, we can also kind of scale them up and down. How do we scale them up and down? Let's say I want to get this, let's say this current was, I don't know, 100 microamps. Okay? And I want to make a copy that's 200 microamps here. What, how can we do that? Yes, David. By changing the area of the VJT, so it changes the IS. Right, you can ch change the area of the VJT, so I can make this basically two, twice as large, right? Now, let me ask a question. That's, that's a great point, and that's exactly how we think about it. If you were to actually implement this as a ch as, as in, in a real circuit, and you wanted this ratio to be as close to two as possible, how would you implement this? Do you make something, let's say, if you look at the top view of the bipolar transistor, right? So this is the emitter. Would you make something that's, whose emitter is twice as large? Because that would double the IS, presumably. Is that the best way to make this ratio two? Or what, what problem can, we, can you imagine this having if you just did that? Well, you can see this is really a three-dimensional device. I mean, if you look at the cross-section of this thing, there's, this is something like that. And then this guy has it. So the side, the, the, the way the currents distribute around this thing can be different, et cetera, et cetera. So can you think of a better way to make this ratio exactly two or as close to two as possible? So change the... Uh, make them in parallel, right. So the, another way to achieve exactly this is instead of having this, one transistor, two, use two transistors that are, again, as closely matched to this guy, but you make them, to make two, 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 twice as many of them, right? Two of them. And what that does, it allows you to get an exact ratio. What if I wanted to get a ratio of, let's say, 1.5? Can you think of that? If you wanted to get a ratio of 1.5, for example, what would you do? There are many different ways. Just yeah. Put two, there and three. two there and three there, right? For example, right? You make this, you double this up, and then you triple that. Now, if I come back to you with square root of two, then we can make it. Or some, of course, we can make the different ratios. I and mean, we'll see different other ways of doing this uh, in a few minutes. Uh, that, but, but you can see, there's some level of capability to re, re, replay, uh, just make replicas of this current. So just make different copies of this, right? So if I make that and make one with, I don't know, five here, then I would get five, you know, two and a half times, et cetera, et cetera, right? You can make some ratios of currents and all those things. So this all looks good and nice, and it provides a way of doing things. Uh, there are some subtleties about this that we need to think about, and we'll talk about uh, in order. Now, there's the most fun subtlety about this, which is perhaps not the most, well, it can be very important depending on when it comes in, but it's fun. Um, I found this out by experiment, or it, the, first, the first time I observed it through first hand. So this is what I was doing. I was, it's a slightly different thing. I was making a driver for a motor when I was an undergrad. And I was just making some, something to drive a DC motor that could go one way or another. So it had two sets of transistors. And it was a pretty hefty motor, so I needed big power transistors. So I, one power transistor was not enough to carry all the current. So I said, well, okay, you know what? I take five bipolar transistors, five NPNs, and put them in parallel, and five PMPs to drive the other side, so we'll talk about that too. 
But anyway, so just like the five NPNs in parallel that were driving some, some load. And I said, okay, great, I make my PCB, etc. It looks very nice. I test it, it looks good. So I hook it up to the motor, turn it on. And so these five transistors were in a row, right? So they were like just one, two, three, four, five. Boom, 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 boom. They just like explode in sequence. And then of course the other five on the other side exploded in the sequence, but that's it. I said, and they were kind of expensive transistors. It was spectacular, but it was, okay, wait a second. Mm. And this is where I was really, I really failed. Because I did not think about, okay, I didn't start thinking about what's happening. I went and bought another five transistors and put them back in. And repeated the experiment and got the same result. And the second time I said, okay, well now I have to find out, understand what ha what's happening. This is not <laughs> working. So what do you think was happening? If you have these bipolar transistors in parallel, like this, there's a problem. And what do you think that problem was? I described to you pretty accurately what happened. And one of the clues, by the way, was that they went in a sequence, just boom, first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Well, there's something that you don't know yet, and we will talk about it in more detail today, but is that the VBE, the base emitter voltage of a tra bipolar transistor, has a reverse temperature coefficient, meaning that if the temperature goes up, the VBE goes down, and we'll see why later today. So just take it, I mean, it's around negative two millivolts per degree C. But we'll see it today. We'll see it later today, but why? But it's, so now think about it. So if these guys, let's say these three, if one of them gets a little bit warmer, just a tiny bit warmer, what happens to it? Yeah. What's the thermal that right, because it would, for the same current, it will have a smaller VBE, which basically means that for the same VBE, it will carry more current. So more current goes through it, what happens? It heats up. More current goes through it, heats up more. Positive feedback, right? Just, it goes, all the current goes through this one, this one explodes, then who's gonna explode next? The one that was, warmer, which is the one that was most closely placed to that one, the one next to it that got a little bit warmer due to the heat of this one. That one goes, and the next one goes, and that one goes. This is called a thermal runaway process. And it happens in bipolar transistors, if you put them just in parallel. So we say, well, what? Doesn't matter, I mean, so it can actually even happen from the center. It, it happens, I mean, in, in, in that case, it's basically whoever, it's a thermal fluctuation, right? So thermal fluctuations would cause one of them to become a little bit warmer, and as a result, it will start drawing a little bit more current, which makes it a little bit warmer, and it can start from anywhere. It just, in my case, happened to start from one side. It, it, there's no magic, I mean, it can start from the middle and go both ways, just right? So uh, it, it, it can happen anyway, but it, it's not a good thing, obviously. Yes? Okay, what's the solution, right? So let's find out. The, the, well, to, the solution to any problem comes the first step, and the most important step in finding a solution to any problem is understanding the problem. So we understand the problem now. So we need to create a mechanism for this voltage, if it is a little fluctuation, not to draw a lot of current, right? And the simplest solution, in fact, is to put a little tiny resistor here. And this is what's gonna happen. Think about the situation where all of a sudden, this volt, this gets a little bit warmer, right? So when it gets warmer, what happens is that its VB starts, it tries to draw more current, but as soon as it tries to, tries, to, try, tries to draw more current, that current has to go through this resistor, right? So it raises this voltage, which basically in turn lowers this VBE. This is essentially, you can think of it, uh, this degeneration, this emitter degeneration, essentially you can think about it as a negative feedback. Because as soon as you start increasing the current, what happens is that the emitter voltage is gonna go up because there's more current passing through that resistor, which basically lowers the base emitter voltage. 
And it doesn't have to be a big resistor. It, you can actually calculate exactly what it needs to be and add a little bit of margin to it. So this is an interesting problem. I mean, these kind of problems occur. So that's one problem for something like this. So, so yeah, we can deal with that. And a lot of times we don't even show these explicitly uh, in, in, in the drawing of the circuit, but we realize that there, we may need to put something like that there in practice. Uh, so that's one. Um, what else? What else? Can, can you see a problem with this arrangement? Other problems? Yes? If that current has to provide all the base currents. That current has to provide all the base currents, right? Because, and you may say, well, if it's two of these base currents, that's fine, two over beta. If but you have like pff, multiple branches feeding multiple different stages, there's a differential stage sitting here, there is a follower sitting here, there's another thing sitting here, and these things can be scaling up because some of them need, need, may need to draw current, so their base current scales up. So after a while, a little base current here, a little bit of base current there, you're talking about re some real current, right? Some serious currents. So how do we deal with that? Can you think of a way of dealing with that? Yes? Right. Use the beta of the transistor. Use the current gain of the transistor again. So basically, you can say, OK, I can put another transistor here and connect this to VCC. And what this does is that whatever total base current that's coming through here, all of the sum of all these base currents that come through here, I only need to provide one over beta of that. Right? Because what, this is the sum of all the base currents. Right? And this is that sum divided by beta. Right? So you can actually reduce the base current by, by that factor, which is, which is a nice thing to do. So that's another problem that we can solve. For the, for. Any other problems? Other problems that you can see identify with this kind of distribution? So the, am I current? Yes, but see, if this were a current source, that's a good question. But this is, if this were a current source, I am separating it from the supply, right? I'm oh, sorry, I meant the, the, some of the base currents. Oh, OK, you, you mean here? Right, but see, this will draw what it needs to draw, right? So it na naturally will select whatever the current base current is. It, the way it works is that the BBE will adjust itself so that this current provides that current. So yes, you, you, you have to still provide a little bit of that current, but it's not as severe now. So, so that's, that's something that, yes, it's a, and if you really are bothered by this, you can make this into a Darlington. You can put another one here. You can make it beta squared. And, I mean, it, it, nobody does that. Really, at that point, it doesn't matter. Right? But do you see another problem? That's actually an artifact of the BJT. The first one also, that, that thermal runaway was also an artifact of the specific physics of the BJT. There are certain things that are specific to certain kinds of devices, and there are certain things that are generally true about any three-terminal device. That one, that first one was a BJT-specific thing. Second one, this beta business, uh, this base current business, can be specific to BJT or any other device that has a th terminal three current. So if you need to provide terminal three, if your MOSFET leakage current through the gate becomes so excessive and you have a lot of these, then you need to worry about putting another MOSFET here too. Um, there's another problem that's specific to the BJT, which is in the saturation of BJT. What's the definition of saturation? Saturation is when the base emitter junction becomes forward bias, right? So if one of these guys is saturated, what happens to the base? There will be a lot of base current, right? The base current is going to increase significantly. So here's the problem, and I've actually seen this firsthand, is that you can have a circuit where everything may be looking great here. You have some circuitry here, and you don't see anything wrong, but it's not operating properly. And it's because something somewhere else in this branch has crunched. This has crunched, that's what we call it, crunched, basically. So the voltage is low enough that this has become forward biased. This has become saturated. And as a result, you're drawing excess current that messes up all the other branches of biasing. This also is a BJT-specific problem. Because in MOSFETs, if you go into triad regions, you still don't have gate current, right? But in BJTs, you do have base currents that will be affected by that. 
because you basically have a junction that you're forward biased. So that, that's a, there are some things that are specific to devices, and there are certain things that are different. Now, another important thing about the current, so, so if you take this and make the equivalent MOSFET version of this thing, how would it look like? Well, in MOSFETs, it looks very similar in many different ways, right? I don't need to really worry about that secondary transistor if I'm dealing with classical MOSFET, right? If my gate current is not significant. So we can do this. And then you can have copies of this thing. Now, if I wanted to scale these things up or down in MOSFETs, how would we do that? How can we do that? Well, so this is on my IRF. This is VDD. Now, what is the parameter that controls the relative currents of these things? It's a more direct design parameter, right? It's W over L. Now, so if this is W over L, and let's say I want to get twice as much current, I make this what? Should I make this? Let me give you a few choices. So the first one is a transistor with 2W over L. The second one is a transistor with W over L over 2. You understand what I mean by these two, right? And then the third one is two transistors in parallel, each one at W over L. What are the advantages and disadvantages, if any, for any of them? You see, the th you understand the three choices, right? What do I mean by this? So if you look at the transistor from the layout perspective, this is what a MOSFET looks like. This is the source, this is the drain, this is the gate, right? I mean, we draw it this way, but it's really like that. Now, so this is W and this is L. Now, if I make 2W over L, it basically means that you have something that looks like that. So this is 2W over L. W over 2L, L over 2 means the same W, but L is now L over 2. That's what this means. Now, and this obviously means two of them side by side. Yes? Okay, so the one, the first, so the, the, it was a multi-part answer. So, so let's let's take, deal with the, the one part at a time. So between these two, you're saying that you want you prefer this one because if you do that, then you are changing your L, which basically means that your early if, uh, the, the the channel length modulation is changing, right? And all of those parameters will change. So and you don't know exactly how it's changing if it's not changing linearly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that is correct. So this one is definitely preferred over that one in that comparison. So now, let's go to these two. Is there an advantage of doing it basically, well, this, this, the, the picture really goes to this one. This is really this. So let me just draw, sketch it correctly. So this is 2w over l, and then this guy was the w over l. Is there any advantage? or disadvantage to one of these over the other one. You mentioned the con connections and losses and all those things. That is true, but at the same time, you can make metal connections, and metal is not usually dominating your thing. Is there any advantage in terms of matching to this thing compared to this thing, if I want to get that exact ratio of two? Yes? Mm -hmm. And um, if you um, make it the, uh, twice longer, uh, the pinch off at the boundary is less, is uh, larger than the two that Right. So I think what you're referring to, I, I, I think I agree, is that what's happening here, these edges, right, and here, you want everything to be duplicated, right? If you just have that, you have twice as many of the length effect, but you have as the same amount of edge effects, whatever behavior you get at the edge. right? Here, though, you have doubled everything, including the edges. 
So in terms of matching, if you want to get an exact ratio, this is actually preferred to that. Because those three-dimensional effects that you get in the transistor will be more exhibited in this case. I mean, they would be more pronounced here in that ratio. So you're replicating it exactly. Right? So there are these kind of considerations that we need to think about. But what else? So is, is there some other aspect to this thing, to the MOSFET part? So yes, we can scale them up and down. Um, we don't have to worry about that if one of the stages crunches. That's one of the advantages. Because if this one crunches, it will only hurt itself. Its output resistance will drop. You go in the triad region, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not going to go and screw up something somewhere else. If you're biasing a reference branch, which may be common to multiple blocks in your circuit, is messed up in one place, it's going to just be local. It's not going to be affected. It's because those things are actually hard to track. Because you're looking for a problem here, while the problem is really induced somewhere else. Right? So those kind of things are important to keep in mind. Now, perhaps we kind of like we didn't talk about the most important aspect of what constitutes a current source. What makes a current source a current source, a good current source? What is the number one property of a current source to be considered a current source to begin with, or a good one for that matter? What is it? The output impedance, right? You want to have a high output impedance. That's by definition what makes a current source a good current source, the higher the output. So the key question for all of these things is what's the output impedance looking into here? So in the case of a bipolar transistor, if I ask you what is the output impedance, we can easily tell, right? In both cases, we can easily tell. It's the output. In this case, it's simple. It's the output resistance of the bipolar transistor. What is it? RO is VA over IC, which really is, in general, DI2 um, to DV21 in a case of an arbitrary three-terminal device, right? You remember we had the arbitrary three-terminal device. Looks like that. This is terminal one, two, and three. Well, it's really one over that. So it's this thing. That's the RO. Defines the RO, right? So it's the early voltage divided by IC. So you can actually, it's really di directly dictated by the current that it carries. So the larger you make the current, the smaller it becomes. Uh, that's what it is. It's basically, you don't have much control over it in the case of a BJT. Now, in the case of a MOSFET, what is the output resistance? Again, we are getting to device-specific stuff. So what do we have in the case of a MOSFET here? Well, we know we've done these calculations before. So it's L divided by ID dxd dvds. This is a parameter for a given design, for a given transistor, et cetera. It's a, it's a given parameter, right? So you, you will have whatever you have. And here, so this tells you that you have one parameter you can play. The ID dependence is also similar to the bipolar, right? The only difference here is that you have control over this. You have design control over that. Because this is a design parameter. This is something you can actually change the way you draw the transistor. You can make the L smaller or larger. So if you are in need of a large output impedance, you can always use a larger channel length. And that would allow you to get a higher output resistance, which is potentially a useful thing. Um, there's a trade-off there. There are multiple trade-offs that we'll discuss. So what is the first trade-off that comes to mind if I make this device longer? It's slower. It's kept larger capacitance, et cetera, et cetera. So that's fine. So that's one thing. There's another one that's probably even more important than that we'll talk about in a second. Um, but yeah, that's for that. Now, let me ask a more basic question. So, so we've seen two examples. We've seen a bipolar and a MOSFET current mirror and current replication. In general, if you had an ATD, arbitrary three terminal device, what is the property that you need to have to make something like this work? So in an arbitrary three terminal device, for this to be an effective way of generating and copying currents. What are some of the properties that you need to have? To be more insensitive to the D1C compared to the D1C. Exactly. So I'm going to re repeat what you said. Try to 
replica verbatim. So it has to be more insensitive to V1, 2. So let's say this is a three terminal device. This is one, this is two, I'm sorry, one, three. Um, so it has to be more sensitive to V2, 1 than V3, 1. And the more insensitive it is to V2, 1 compared to V3, 1, the current, then the better this kind of current replication or current mirroring would be. In other words, if I want to write it quantitatively or analytically, you can say DI2, DV31 has to be much ideally much greater than DI2, DV21. So any device that has a better, a higher V2, so this is basically, if you think about this, this is GM, right? In, and this is 1 over RO. Right? So in the case of a BJT, a typical BJT, this is great because RM is significantly smaller than RO. Or GM is significantly larger than GO, typically. Because it's a ratio of VA over VT in a BJT, right? Because RO is VA over IC, and GM is IC over VT. So this ratio is VA over VT, the early voltage over the thermal voltage, 100 volts divided by 25 millivolts, the intrinsic gain. Now, but if this ratio becomes comparable, then this is not necessarily going to operate very well, at least in its current form. There are improved forms that we'll discuss. But in its current form, it's not going to be really the best thing to deal with. OK? Make sense? All right. Now, what else? What else matters in the case of a current source? You're trying to be making current sources, right? What else matters here? There's another thing that we haven't talked about really yet. So output resistance is one. The output resistance is whatever you get, in this case, out of a single transistor. But we are not limited to these things, by the way. We talked about this, and we'll talk about examples of how to improve this. We know how to increase the output resistance, for example, Casco, things of that sort. We'll come to that in a few minutes. But before we even go there, there's one more thing that quite matters when you're making really current sources this way, in terms of how good a current source they are. The output resistance is one. But there's another thing. This current source is not an ideal current source, right? At some point, it stops being a current source, or a good one, or a less bad one. Okay. If this voltage goes down, at some point, you're not in the pinch-off region, or in the forward active region in the case of a BJT, right? You go into what region? You go into the triad region here, or you go into the saturation. And at that point, it's not a current source anymore. It's not a really good current source anymore. So what do we do? So that, that tells us there's a range. This goes back to the question of headroom. How, much room, how, much, how low you can go on these things. So in the case of a BJT, for example, if you go to the BJT, if I ask you, so what is it? What, what, how low can this go? What is the lowest voltage before this stops being really a good current source? What is that? Say again? Point 0.2 Vsat, right? So this can be as low as Vsat. So that it can be, as long as this voltage is greater than Vsat, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 volts, oops, 0.2 volts, this is okay, right? Above that, you're okay, because this junction will be reverse biased, you're fine. Now, below that, you have a problem. And the same thing is true, by the way, in the, complementary branches, which we'll, I'll talk about in a second again. But um, so how about here? What is the lowest this voltage can go? What is the minimum that this can be at before you leave the, tri uh, the pinch off region, you enter the triad region? We know that the requirements, right? To be in the, triad, in the pinch off region, VDS has to be greater than VGS minus VT. We, this parameter, this is the gate overdrive, right? We call it gate overdrive. We've talked about this, delta VGS. We show it at delta VGS. This is the parameter that appears in every place. The, the amount over the VT that you are. So essentially, what is the lowest this can be? So this V out has to be greater than what? Delta VGS, the gate overdrive. Right? Now, what is delta VGS numerically? 
Unlike the BJT where we said it's like 0.1, 0.2 volts anyway, it's kind of like a fixed thing, this is dictated by the current and the dimensions. Why? Because we know that ID is mu n C ox over 2, W over L, I mean in the case of a classic quadratic MOSFET, and it doesn't matter. I mean that this, this relationship would, the exact functionality will change, but the general behavior doesn't if this is not quadratic. So if you have this thing, this is delta VGS obviously, right? So delta VGS is square root of ID divided by mu n C ox over 2, W over L. So if I want to have large room to operate, in other words, I don't want this to crunch or go into the triad region for high voltages. I want this to voltage to be low, right? I want the gate overdrive to be small. So what are the things that I can change to make that small? There are really three things that are in my control, right, as a designer. This, that, and that. The current, the, the width, and the length. Now, if I want to, the current, I have somewhat of a control, but it's usually a design parameter, right? I mean, so you, you say, I want to make a stage, I, want a current, I need a current source of half a milliamp. That's usually something that's dictated by somewhere, something somewhere else, right? The other part of your design. So you may have some control over that, but not a whole lot. The thing that you really have control in terms of design is, are these two. So what do you want W to be if you want to have a high headroom? So you want W, so if, if W goes up, delta VGS goes down, right? So you can use a wider device, and your gate overdrive would become smaller. L goes up, delta VGS goes up, right? And you can see that there's a direct trade-off here. Yes, you, if you want to increase your output resistance, you want larger L, but then you pay the price for it in the amount of headroom you have to operate with something like that. So that comes into play when you're designing. So these two are an important part of the discussion. But yeah, this is the way you control it. This is the way you play with that. But regardless of that, if you think about it, if you look at the V out versus ID for one of these current sources, it kind of looks like this. And at some point, this is that delta VGS. Right? At that point, instead of having that RO of the transistor, you start seeing much lower resistance because that's what you see, the on-channel. You see the, the non-pinched off channel, which will have much lower resistance. And this stops being a good current source at that point. Now, both of these, I mean, any, any, all of these things, as long as you have complementary devices, they can be replicated, because the current sources we've drawn, all of them so far, are essentially good at sinking current. Now, you can actually make a current that source that sources current. So how do I do that? So for example, let's say you have a branch here, okay? And then you can come up, well, oh, I'm running into my ATD. And I can make a complementary mirror. The mirrors, there's nothing that says that they have to be n-type. I can make a complementary mirror with PMT transistors, and now this can source current. And then I, when we do this, we can actually play with the ratios here. You can have Xn1, N2, N3. You can actually have different ratios here implemented, either by controlling the number or the size of the transistors in either of these cases, right? And the same thing is true in the MOSFETs, right? You can do the same thing with MOSFETs. You can take one of these branches, go up here, make a PFET branch. Of course, you have to have one of them diet connected and go that way. Now, by the way, what happens if I diet connect this guy? Can I diet connect that one in this case? What's the problem? There's a problem. For this to be a good current source, what's the first thing that it needs to be doing what, or it needs to present? A high output impedance, right? If I diet connect something, what's the impedance you see looking into here? RM. Right? That's why the diode connection usually ha not, well, doesn't typically happen there unless there's some fancy special thing you're doing with that. The diode connection happens where 
You don't need a hybrid. You see, this is, and this is t a typical theme. Not always, but it happens a lot. A high impedance driving a low impedance. Right? It's a high impedance driving a low impedance. Go from high to low, high to high. And the reason is that if you have a high impedance driving low impedance, then most of your current will end up in the low impedance, in the target. Because then you have a high, impedance, high resistance in parallel with low resistance. You have a current divided between those two, which basically sucks most of the current into the low impedance, which is here, which is where you want it to be so you can replicate it or reflect it, mirror it somewhere else. Again, I want you to think about these design choices as we go forward. But this is a design class, really. Okay? And yes, there's a lot of analysis in it, but they, they need to think about why we are making these choices. And I want you to ask questions. And the beauty of design is that it's like painting. You need to understand your paint. You need to understand the brushes. You need to understand the, 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 the canvas you're working on. But once you understand those basic things, which is the basic scientific part of it and the underlying principles, then you can use it to have your own style. You can do it the way you want. There are many, many different ways to solve a problem. It's a divergent problem, not a convergent problem, like science. There's not one known answer or one unknown answer you're trying to find. Anyway, OK. So th those are the kind of basic principles of this thing. So, so we can see that these current mirrors have these limitations and the, the, the associated aspects of it. But that's the basic principle. So now what we will do uh, right now is to go and discuss a little bit more. So now let's see. If you wanted to improve these things, what are some of the things we can do? So let's see some of the limitations of this thing and see how we can improve these. What are some of the improvements we can present to this? So first question is here. So let's go back to one of the questions that I posed to you a few minutes ago, which was, if you wanted to make this 2 thirds of that, right, or 1 third of that, what would you do? So if I wanted to make this one th a current source that's 1 third of that current, what would you do? You make the solution, one solution was to make this three and make that one, and then you will get one third. OK, fine. What if I needed 1 50th? Then it means that your reference branch needs to be 50 times larger, and then it becomes impractical at some point, right? If I want something that's 1,000 times smaller, then I need to make 1,000 transistors there because I just want to get it to 1 1,000th. So can we think of a way of, if you have a reference branch, to scale it properly? Yes? Just split it and then do a PMOS and another MOS and just keep going. So you scale it down. You're saying this, keep scaling it down like what you were like here, kind of scale it down. That, that, that's one way. But as you're scaling down, you're wasting current. Because in these branches, you are using current, right? There's DC current flowing. This, these branches consume power because this is VDD or VCC, whatever the voltage supply is, across this thing, times this is the power that this, this branch consumes, the branches consume. So yes, you can do that. And we do that from time to time. But there is actually a somewhat of a simple and elegant solution uh, to this that a guy named Bob Whitelar many, many years ago came up with. And it's called, called Whitelar Current Source. He was actually a very talented designer. Uh, and a very interesting, centric individual, too. But uh, anyway, suffice it to say that I think he died of uh, cocaine overdose. <sighs> but anyway, he was a talented guy. Uh, so not that's despite the fact that he died of cocaine overdose. But anyway, so the question is, can I do something to scale the current of this? Let's say this is the, the branch I'm trying to make a smaller current with. Can you think of a way of scaling this? Down. What controls the current in this branch? What is the primary parameter that controls the current? VBE, right? So what if I make the VBE that it experiences smaller by having, it share, having to share this VBE with something else? What if we put a, that resistor there? So what does it do? So let's see. So this is what we are looking at. So to simplify it, again, I'm taking all the clutter out 
this is the stage we are talking about now, right? Let's say these two transistors have the same sizes, the same IS. What is the current? So, and this is, let's say, I ref. And let's forget about the base current. So the question is, what is this current, I out, in terms of I ref? How do we calculate it? Well, we know that this VBE is equal to this VBE plus this R, right? So you can say VBE1 equals VBE2 plus I out R. R I out, right? But VBE1 is VT natural log of IC or I ref, essentially, divided by IS. And VBE2 is VT natural log of I out over IS. So you can move one of these to the other side. You can basically say R I out equals VT. So if you move this to the other side, you have the difference of two logs. So basically, you divide the arguments. The ISs cancel. You have I ref divided by I out. So this is actually, if you looked at this, if I'm designing, this is actually a very good design equation. This is not as good an analysis equation. What do I mean by design equation? I mean that if I want to find what my R, R needs to be for a given I ref and a desired I out, I can just plug them in the, into this equation and calculate what the R needs to be. Right? That's a good design equation. It tells you what the parameter needs to be. Yes? Do people use this a lot? Because it seems like if there's like an exponential relationship to R, then some process variation will change. Well, it's a logarithmic dependence, right? I mean, so, so, yeah, yeah there's, there's some, some strong dependence on R. But yeah, so that's a good question. So say, how sensitive are you to the R, right? And there is some sensitivity, but it's usually used when you're trying to scale the current down by significant factors. So it's a case where you may not care. I mean, you have a reference branch that's, let's say, 100 microamps, and you're trying to make a 1 microamp reference branch. And you don't care if it's 1 microamps or 1.2 microamps or 0.8. You want a very small current. For example, you want to buy something in sub-threshold, or if you want to kind of do something like that, right? Uh, then you are trying to create a branch that you know it's small. Its exact value may not be as precise. But again, yes, you're right. I mean, it has dependence on R. You're right. Now, if you want to use it. As an analysis equation, if I want to find what I out is, if it's a problem given to you, then how do you solve this? Well, you're solving for I out. It's basically, you can, there are different ways to solve it. You can just solve it iteratively, if, if nothing else. You can just plug a number in there, just calculate I out based on that, plug it back in. And after a couple of iterations, it very quickly converges. But this is the more important thing. You're solving for R, because that's design. If you're solving for I out, that's analysis. And you may say, oh, this same algebra. Yes and no. It's the way, different ways of thinking. Yes, it's the same algebra. It's a different way of looking at the same algebra. OK, so, so that's one thing you can do, one of the things. So, so that's one way of getting smaller currents. Now, how about if, let's say, if your output resistance is not sufficiently low, Let's say you're trying to make something where your output resistance is of critical significance. Give me an example of a situation where you really care about your output resistance being high. What's an example where the output resistance needs to be high? Yes, for example, if you want a high common mode rejection ratio in a differential amplifier, right? We know that the output resistance of this thing matters. And if you're CMRR is a parameter of significance to you, then you, the first thing you need to work on is to making sure that this output resistance is high. And if this is not high enough, what you get out of a transistor, what do we do? What are the things that we can do? So cascode, right? Essentially introduce resistances here. Because even if you have a resistance here, your output resistance is increasing, right? What is the output resistance here? We know that, right? We've calculated these things before. And that's why we did it, because now we can use them. So this R out, if I ask you what's this R out, you know, well, you know approximately if R is not excessively large, it's 1 plus GM R times RO. If in general we know that it's RO times 1 plus GM R 
divided by 1 plus gm r over beta. This is over alpha, really, but it doesn't matter. And we know in the limit, if r becomes very large, this can go to beta, r o. Right? We've talked about this. So what you can do, you can actually say, OK, you know what? Make, let's make a cascode current mirror. How do we make a cascode current mirror? So if you look at, at the cascode, what you really have, you need to have a cascode branch and a cascode, oops, a cascode, uh, a cascode reference branch and a cascode current source. So something like this. Now, if you look at that, what do you see? Ostensibly, it appears that looking down here into here, you see R01, let's say, or RO. And therefore, this is large, so you would expect to see beta RO, right, at the output of this thing. At least it appears based on our simple analysis. This is one of those cases that when you actually draw the full small signal model, because of the signal path that exists here, so there is a signal path through here. The two paths for the signal. There's one, if you apply an excitation here, part of it excites this path, but part of it comes back through the device and starts modulating the base of this guy. And when you put all of that together, you can actually do it as an exercise. Just draw the small signal model for these four and apply a Vx and look at Ix. It turns out that what you see at the output is not beta RO. In fact, it's beta RO over 2. Now, can I give you an intuitive explanation of why it is exactly beta R over 2? No. Does it exist? Possibly. But I don't know it, if it exists. But worst comes to worst, this is one of those cases, basically, that you resort. And probably there's a good explanation for it that tells you why it is beta R over 2. But anyway, so the, the long and short of it is that if you draw the small signal model, because of the fact that this gets modulated here, it's smaller. So when you push this node up, this node gets pushed up a little bit. So basically, you can get a little modulation here that would reduce the output resistance. That's the best explanation I can give you. But anyway, you can do it. So anyway, so the, the output resistance of this thing happens to be beta r over 2. And we can calculate it, et cetera, et cetera. So what, the other question about this thing, perhaps even a more important question about this, is what is the headroom? How low can the output voltage go on something like this? Any thoughts on that? So what is the lowest voltage you can go before it stops being a good current source? Say again? 0.4. OK, so let's see. So your, your thinking was each one of them requires a Vsat, right? You said 0.2 here, 0.2 here. But is that true? Let's find out. So if this voltage, what is this voltage at? It's like this voltage here, this base. It's at the VB on, right? It's like a 0.7. Let's call it VB on. Let's call it VBE, right? So this is around 0.7. Now, if that is 0.7, what is the highest, this, what is this voltage at? Because remember, there's a VBE here and there's a VBE here, right? So this is at 2 VBE, 2 VBE on. Now, what is the voltage here? VBE, right? Because you've dropped the VBE down here. So. What is the lowest voltage this can be before this transistor starts going into the saturation? V beyond plus V sat, right? Because there's a V sat here and there's a V beyond here. So it means that, and this is 0.7, this is like 0.2, so this is basically the lowest this can be is 0.9 volts. It's a VBE on plus a V sat. Right? A little bit wasteful, isn't it? 
it feels a little bit wasteful because really this guy is far from saturation because this, this is VBE. This junction is not even forward biased at all. I mean, start, this can be as far as 0.5 forward. So this can go as low as 0.2, but it's really kept at 0.7. So this guy is kept in a really good shape, right? This one is not even pushed to its limit anywhere close to its limit. And as a result, this one will saturate way before the voltage really re reaches the limit, which was ideally with two V sats, right? So this is a problem, right? So, so instead of this happening here, you, are hap you have a saturation that's happening here. So this is VBE plus V sat. So that's, that's a problem. That's a trade-off. That's a price you pay for this. So this will not have as much range, but it will have a output, large output resistance. Now, in the case of a MOSFET, so let's look at that in the case of a MOSFET again. Uh, OK, let's just keep it here and then do a MOSFET on the side. So we can do a similar thing in a MOSFET, right? We can make a cascode in a MOS with MOSFETs. So if you make a cascode in MOS with MOS transistors, This is the way it will start looking. Like. Now, the key question is, what is the output resistance? Well, the output resistance we know, right? right? It's GM2RO2 of this transistor times RO1, roughly. And here, actually, that issue doesn't exist anymore because there's no base current and all those things. So this is basically what you see in the cascode MOSFET. Anyway, um, but here the, the key question really is, what, how low can this voltage go? What is the lowest output voltage this can be? Well, let's, let's look at the voltages. Let's look at the DC voltages and see what they tell us. So this one, what is this voltage? This is the VGS, right? But we can write VGS in terms of VT and the gate overdrive, right? We had this expression, right? Um, this thing, delta VGS, right? So if I want to write this VGS, do you agree that this voltage is at VT, the threshold voltage, plus delta VGS, the gate overdrive of these transistors, right? That's by definition VGS, right? Because VGS is defined, and delta VGS was VGS minus VT. So VGS is delta VGS plus VT, by definition, right? And if that's VT plus delta VGS, that's another VGS, right? So what would this be at? What is it at? 2VT plus 2 delta VGS, assuming that they all have the same size and the same current, right? W over L, W over L, W over L. W over L, let's say they have all the same current, so they will have the same delta VGSs, and therefore the VGS minus VTs will be the same. So that's what that, what is this voltage, DC wise? Well, we, go, we are going down a VT plus delta VGS, right? So this becomes VT plus delta VGS. Agree? So now again, what is the lowest this voltage can go before it enters the triode region? A delta VGS above this, right? So again, you have a situation where we are being wasteful because this is V out. And as soon as V out hits VT plus 2 delta VGS, this starts going into triode region. And it stops being a good current source. This is I out versus V out this current versus this voltage. Does it make sense? Again, we are giving this much too, this guy too much room to play. It doesn't really need that much. This has way too much, right, at its disposal. Does it make sense? Okay. Yeah, good. So the key question is, is there something we can do about this? Can we do anything about this? Can you think of a solution to this? Can we make this better? In other words, can we modify this circuit? This is another example of design, right? But based on analysis. To make this, because in theory, in principle at least, this should be able to go down, as, down to two delta VGSs. 
Because delta VGS is kind of like a VSAT, right, for a MOSFET. It needs to be able to go down to delta VGS. There's an extra VT there that we need to somehow get rid of. How can we get rid of an VT? Can we think of a way of getting rid of the VT? Well, where do you see a VT roughly? A voltage of VT, the threshold voltage on a MOSFET. Where do you see it when, when it's operating normally? Where do you see something close to a VT? VGS, right? You see it across a VGS. Well, of course, you have the delta VGS on top of that. So what if I could drop another VT here? So, so if I take this branch and I move it to the right, And now somehow, if I could just drop a voltage VT here, would this solve the problem? If I had this ideal voltage source here, would this solve the problem? Would it solve the problem? If I could, if I could magically generate this battery that I had this, that I could put there, what, would that solve the problem? Because then this voltage becomes VT plus two delta VGS. This drops a VT plus delta VGS, so this becomes delta VGS. Right? So that's good, because then this can go down to two delta VGS. So you get a delta VGS here, a delta VGS there. Right? So both of them are at the verge of going to the triad, but they are not entering the triad. The question is that can we get this battery? Well, we don't have a battery, of course, like that. But can we get something that generates that? Well, a MOSFET sounds like a way of doing it, right? Because if I put a MOSFET, okay. here, that's somehow operating at some current that allows it to drop a VT. And how do I do that? For example, let's say I get a, another branch. I bias it through here and connect this to VDD. Would that solve the problem? Would this solve it? Let's say this is another one with W over L. So everything is W over L, the same. Would this solve the problem? Not quite, right? Why? Because I'm at two VT plus two delta VGSs here, right? I'm dropping a VT plus delta VGS here, right? So then this goes to VT plus delta VGS, and then this goes to zero. So this pushes this guy into the triad. So now it's good. How, how short am I? What, what, how much am I short of in terms of voltage? What, what do I need? I need, a little bit, I need to be a little bit higher than this, right? Exactly by delta VGS. Do you agree that if I could make this VT plus two delta VGS, I would be good? Right? Because if this is two VT plus delta VGS, I drop a VT plus delta VGS, I would be at the delta VGS, not zero here. For this to be VT plus two delta VGS, what should this voltage be? That's another VT, right? Plus delta VGS. So I have to be at two VT plus three delta VGS. Do you agree? Can you think of a way of making this voltage, instead of being VT plus delta VGS, being VT plus two delta VGS, oh, this is getting microscopic. VT plus two delta VGS. Can you think of a way of making that be, have double the overdrive, gate overdrive? Scale down the width. Scale down the width, right? Why? This expression, right? Look at this. If I want my delta VGS to double, how much should I scale down the width? Four. Factor of four. So if I make this transistor, instead of W over L, a quarter in size, then its delta VGS would be twice as large, right? And then it allows me to drop down to exactly the right level, so this can be as low as two delta VGS. And instead of having something that looks like this, I will have something that crunches here at two delta VGSs. 
Does it make sense? So that's why we go to something like this. And, and you think about it, so how did they come up with it? Well, they came, came up with it solving the problems one step at a time in a logical progression. And as you will see, there are more complex circuits as we will go forward that we'll see. If you understand how people arrive at it, if you can construct it, then you understand it. Does it make sense? Any questions on this? On this example, really? No? All right, so let's take a quick break.